We have to design an electrical system from scratch for a 36-foot blue water sailboat that we intend to sail around the world, and which will be a full-time video production studio on the side. It's not the simplest of tasks. And so that's why when we landed in British Columbia on our way back towards our refit project in Washington state, we decided to get some help from a local expert. Let me crawl into here. Yeah, here's our, you know. Hello. Hi. Yeah, you guys actually haven't met virtually yet. No, have we you? haven't. Yeah. No. Although Canada has a reputation for snow, here in coastal BC, we actually hardly ever get any. And when we do, everything shuts down. The roads are empty, schools close, stores close, life slows down. Dini and I are here at my parents' place, spending a bit of time before we cross the border back to the States and back to Magic Carpet 2. And as per usual, while we're here, we've got some projects on the go. So because we're inside a lot at the moment, it's the perfect time to think a little bit about our boat's electrical system. We're not quite at the point yet to start installing wires, but we are getting to the point where we need to start at least thinking about the layout of all of this. This is a huge job. We are designing an electrical system completely from scratch. Now, Aladino and I have been looking at this. My dad has been helping us, but there's simply too much to know. And we are not electrical experts. And so we have decided to call in an electrical expert to help us. So actually back when we were doing the big refit of Magic Carpet 1, like before we had the YouTube channel and we were designing the electrical system there, albeit a much simpler one, uh, but we were doing a bit of research and Dina came across a YouTube channel called Pacific Yacht Systems with some really, really good advice. And the guy on that channel, Jeff, is just super knowledgeable. We really like his advice and we've been watching a lot of his videos. And it just so happens that he's Vancouver based. We have a meeting scheduled with him in a few days. We've got a lot of questions and a lot to prepare. We did have a lot to prepare. We wanted to make the most of Jeff's time and we wanted to do a good job pouring over the consultation brief that he had sent us. Basically the first step in thinking through some of the building blocks of any electrical system. So we have our consultation brief printed out and it was a really good exercise, actually, because he sort of broke down the electrical system into different components. It's divided into what Jeff calls building blocks. So, for example, alternator, battery bank size, battery isolator, and all these things. Jeff has a very streamlined process for helping boaters design or alter their electrical systems, and this consultation brief is the first step, where Dini and I outline how we'll be using our boat, how we envision our electrical setup in loose terms. And then in this initial meeting, we'll tackle some big questions, like AGM or lithium? And if lithium, what about internal or external BMS? And should we go with 24 volts or 12 volts? What would be the deciding factor there? And how will AC interact with DC on our boat, especially since we'll be traveling the world and AC voltages will change? How will we charge our batteries, especially if we've got a mixture of AGM and lithium on board, both of which require different charging profiles? So we'll discuss some possible scenarios, and then at the end, it'll be up to us to decide which option is the most appealing. Good morning, everybody. Well, it's the day of the meeting with Jeff. And very unfortunately, two things have happened. First of all, I'm sick. I don't think it's COVID, but in this day and age, one has to be sure. And the second thing that's happened is that it's very, very snowy outside. And so we are not actually meeting Jeff in person. We are meeting him via Zoom, which is too bad because I was really looking forward to the in-person meeting. It's a bit nicer on camera too, but 
here we are. We're gonna make the most of this. Okay, does this work? Sort of, hey? Why not? I mean, the light from the window might change, but that's just what we've got. Hello to you both. Uh, Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hi. Yeah, this is cool. <laughs> All right. So it's it's uh, sort of snowy where we are today. So dreaming about voting yeah. is uh, it's a great escape. And we're discussing uh, their plan on outfitting a Cape George 36 sailboat that is basically, electrically speaking, absolutely bare. Uh, so we're starting from scratch. The beauty here is we can do anything we want. And the downside or the horror that could happen is we can do anything we want. And here, this is completely from scratch, which is very few of us are gonna attempt this, but the same philosophy that we're gonna go through every single one of the building blocks on your potential on the boat, uh, really apply to anybody else who's doing only a portion of your project. In your consultation brief, you had mentioned, you know, full-time cruising. You're obviously running your online business uh, on that boat as well. So there's some requirements, you know, for charging laptops and whatnot. And then the other one too, that you might want to talk to us all about is how much of your time is going to be spent in North America or in places that have 120 volts versus places that are 220. The ultimate goal is to go around the world. So of course, the initial leg of that journey, exploring the coast here as a shakedown cruise, but then ultimately we will be crossing the Pacific, Oceania, Asia, potentially Europe. I don't even actually know if we'll go there. So, okay. So we're a real world circumnavigation. So that's a good background because that does affect, especially on the AC side, right? When you start doing both, you end up having to sacrifice some things because with a boat, as we know, there's thousands of pros and cons to choose. So we'll talk about that later on on the AC side. We'll go through the order of the consultation brief. Um, in the consultation brief, you guys mentioned that your desire is to have mostly a DC based boat. Yeah. you want to elaborate a little bit on what made you decide on that? Um, mainly because AC is really power hungry. Many things are our philosophy of cruising. Um, we don't need an electric coffee grinder. Uh, we don't need a washing machine. Uh, we, we don't need too many conveniences from AC power. So that is why we mostly want to have a reliable DC system. So nonetheless, we are thinking of including AC which is primarily for the laptop, for example, but I mean, that takes 140 watts. Uh, so it's not, it's yeah, still not good. making it an AC boat in any means. Um, no. In mm -hmm. my point of view, it's not, we're not talking 3000 watts. So yeah, so you're right. I mean, the point is it's hard to avoid AC altogether on a boat. You know, at the very least, most people will have uh, a 120 or 220 AC circuits for either a battery charger or for some of us that have an onboard generator, which is very few. So I think for sure we want to include a battery charger. And then the other thing too that you had brought up in your consultation brief, and I think that even if you don't think you need it, I think it's a good idea to have it, is to install AC circuits. It probably makes sense to have all the AC outlets inside the boat to be to one standard. Let's say, for example, 120 volts, you know, uh, 15 amp receptacles, you know, leaving North America where things are not necessarily going to be 120 at 60 hertz. This is where it gets really challenging. Where many boaters decide to have a simplified system is to have a battery charger be the only device that is connected to their shore power system. Um, you don't even buy an inverter charger, you buy an inverter only, uh, which always outputs 60 hertz because inverter chargers cannot, unlike battery chargers, and this is, you'll see, this is the win. A battery charger can have an input range of, let's say, 90 to 250 or whatever it is, and also have a frequency variability. So it'll take both European power or North American power. And then what you would do is you effectively create an island where your inverter is the only device that powers all the AC outlets on your boat. And you see, this is where it gets interesting. You'll never be able to run anything directly offshore power. So if you have a large AC load that you want to run uh, that exceeds your DC charging, then what you end up doing is you end up sort of like a little bit draining your batteries, right? Yeah. So, and that's okay. The majority of the time, you're not going to be connected to shore power, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And so think about it that way. When you have an inverter 
based boating, when you're not connected to shore power, your boat is basically the way we want it, right? Uh, you have batteries. If you're going to run any sort of AC appliances on your boat, that you decide to turn on the inverter to power an AC appliance that you feel that you want to have. Now, the downside of this is that, for example, here in the Pacific Northwest, if you were going to run an AC load continuously, like think about a heater, and maybe it draws, you know, uh, 10, 11 amps at 120, that would not be possible. So all these boaters right now that are having heating systems on their boat and maintaining heat on their boat, and they're drawing, you know, maybe 10, 20, 30 amps of AC current to maintain heat on their boat, well, that that sort of uh, usage would not work on an inverter-based boat, right? So even if you were connected to shore power, you wouldn't be able to exceed the, the draw on your batteries beyond what your battery charger could give you, right? Mm -hmm. So it moderates your consumption. Yeah. Now, one thing to think about, Maya, and you brought that up originally, and I think it's a good point, you know, in life, it's really hard to build something for everything. So what you want to do is you want to say to yourself, okay, what am I going to be doing for the next five, 10 years? And I'm going to build an electrical system for that. And when the boat comes back to North America, let's say it does, or it goes back to Europe or wherever it's final sort of more like resting places for a longer period of time, then you can make changes, right? It's not hard to make changes. It's really not hard on the AC because everything comes to one place and you can just move it around. It's not that difficult because it's really hard to be all things at the same time. Oh, and you mentioned something, uh, maybe also I should bring that up. I hide highlighting the consultation brief. You had mentioned that uh, in your previous boat, you had an AC panel with a reverse polarity light. Uh, can you explain to others why you think that's an important feature? Ooh, I think you'd be better at this. <laughs> uh, I can, I'm fine. Um from my understanding is just because a lot of the, or not a lot, but some of the docks had reversed polarity, like their wiring was just done incorrectly. So, so to, to put it simply from my understanding, it's just some devices can handle it. Some devices burn out. So if you plug in something with reverse polarity, you might burn that device. Reverse polarity, uh, Maya brought a good point, happens actually a lot more often than we'd all like. Uh, reverse polarity is where the hot and the neutral are uh, basically swap. Now, if you've got a reverse polarity, all your AC loads actually have current. Not, they don't have current, but they have voltage in them, right? They're all energized, right? The only thing is there's no current going through because you're stopping them from actually exiting, mm. right? Getting back, but it's yeah. actually come in through the device. So all the devices where you would think they would be disenerg de energized because the breaker is off wouldn't matter. They actually the are. whole circuit would be energized. And the other issue too is in many installations, uh, what some people do is they do a, and they're not supposed to do this, uh, but they do this because they just don't know. They're doing a connection between the AC neutral and the AC ground, thinking that both of them should be tied together on the boat. What happens there, which is interesting, is that you end up having the neutral and the ground tied together. And if they are, and you have a reverse polarity, then your battery, your engine, uh, everything, your chain plates, everything that was grounded is now energized with 120. Oh, wow. So, yeah. So two little errors make a big error. And so that's why reverse polarity is a big, now you won't have that problem because you're not going to make that second simple mistake, right? But making the first simple mistake does happen, not all the time, but here where we are, I'd say maybe 5%, 10% of the docks that I connect to when I'm traveling around will have reverse polarity. And uh, that's fine. Things work. And that's why, you know, there's not a big issue that comes out of it. Where it gets really bad is if you're playing around with your AC system and you have reverse polarity, you might get yourself in danger. And then if you've got an error on your boat where someone tied your AC neutral to your AC ground, um, you could be in a lot of trouble. Totally. Of trouble. And it's a pretty simple solution to it though. So everybody... Check your yeah, reverse polarity. <laughs> and by the way, it's simple. You know, I, yeah, remember totally. I didn't understand that. It's literally a light, an LED light that's at 120 volts uh, that is between your ground and your neutral. Basically a light that is should never be turned on. And if it is, it means that effectively your neutral is energized. So there you go. All right. So let's spark the AC. But I think, I mean, there's it's not final, but I gave you some food for thought. And then we can maybe in the next uh, discussion decide on where you want to go. 
uh, well, not necessarily decide, but tell us where you're leaning more towards then that we can start maybe doing the design that way. Okay. Um, let's talk about the next thing about alternators. You mentioned that you've had good experience with a high output alternator before, Balmar is, yeah. And then you had uh, also an external regulator, uh, the ARS-5, I think, is exactly. that right? Yeah. yeah. I think in your notes, you had a question on what our thoughts or recommendations are for a high output alternator. Mm-hmm. Big fan, big fan, especially on a boat that doesn't have a generator, especially on a boat that's going to leave the dock and not come back to the dock. No, that's something we've, yeah, not regretted once. Uh, one of the best things we did on, on, on our other boat too. It, it, it makes sense. Um, so for the listeners out there, you know, alternators, stock alternators are generally 55 amps, 70 amps, maybe 90 amps. And they're generally, their output curve is only creating really high output and high RPM. And they're also internally regulated, which means they're very conservative. And because they're very conservative, uh, they don't output as much in terms of currents and amps. And it's really important in your case, obviously, because it's going to be probably one of the primary ways that you're going to have to recharge your battery then, right? Um, and, and combined with solar too. I mean, we want to put as much solar as we possibly can on the boat. A hundred percent. Yeah. You're, you're, you read my mind. Now, in terms of sizing an alternator, um, that's really a function of your engine size. It's a function of the pulley system that you're going to have, either you know serpentine, which is ideal over V-belt pulleys or dual V-belt. The, the rule of thumb uh, for sizing an alternator is that generally beyond a 90 amp alternator, you really need dual V-belts or and or a serpentine. It's not to say that you can't have a 120 amp alternator driven by uh, a single V-belt. You certainly can, as long as you derate your alternator up. And that's something to think about for all of us. Sometimes what you want to do is you want to buy the largest alternator that's going to fit within reason and derate its output. So it's a little bit like driving a car. <clears throat> you know, our cars can go a lot faster or way higher en engine RPM than most of us would ever ask of them. Same thing with an alternator. So having an alternator, let's say you say you do the math and you figure out you need a, a, a 90 amp alternator. It might make sense to buy a 120 amp alternator and derate its output so it never outputs more than 90 amps. So it doesn't overload your pulley, but at the same time, the alternator is able to handle being outputting uh, 90 over 120. It's gonna be a lot, a lot easier for an alternator that's bigger, that outputs less, than to ask your alternator to be at red line, meaning give me everything you have all the time. Totally. And my philosophy, um, exactly. Maybe I've heard yeah. it somewhere before. <laughs> yeah. And, and I'm a big proponent of that. And the beauty is these external regulators allow us to derate an alternator output, which means they run less hard, which means they have a longer life. There has been a few questions that have come up, small case versus large case, for example. Does that also go in the same line of thoughts of like derating an alternator of instead of having a small one, you have a large one, which ventilates better and all of that. But yeah, on the other is. side, I know that the weight and the volume could also add more wear and tear on the engine. So uh, I was curious if you have any input on that. In most cases, if you can fit a large case alternator, it's preferable over a small case alternator that has a really, really high output. I think it's a big challenge to dissipate heat on the smallest alternators, on the small case alternators. And where it gets even more interesting, the next part is going to be the batteries, right? Because if you end up choosing a lithium house battery bank, then you really need to get, you know, one of the best alternators you can get your hands on. Is there anything else we want to talk about alternators before we dive in? Because a battery bank, I think, is going to be, that's going to set up a lot of things uh, for your boat. You want to dive into that now? Sure. Um, yeah, the lithium versus AGM question is something we've been talking about. To my mind, lithium just seems like a clear choice. Like you get more power in less space. But Aladino is a little bit more hesitant about it. And I would love to hear from you, like, what are the downsides of lithium? Like, what should we be careful of before just going, yeah, of course, lithium? Well, first of all, you see this on the internet a lot. A lot of people have either made a choice and they want other people to do the same choices they have. 
So there's a huge desire out there from all of us to want our ideas to be corroborated by others. Totally. The reality trying is to make it clear that this is just our choice. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And the reality is it's a decision. But let's focus a little bit on what lithium does and what lithium doesn't do. The upside would be density. Same amount of space, you'd have a way larger battery bank. Lithium wins, it's a space saver and it's a weight saver. The other thing too that's interesting about lithium that is often not talked about, which is probably one of the big advantages, is the ability to sustain a voltage throughout the discharge, the discharge cycle of the battery. Any sort of your equipment is pretty much always going to have a consistent voltage. So that would be another advantage. Um, one that's touted a lot is car charge acceptance rate. And sometimes some people will brag, oh, it's 3C, so three times capacity or 0.5C, 1C, 2C. And it's true, if you had a really tiny battery bank and it has only 50 amp hours, yeah, you could potentially charge that battery at two times C, right? So now you'd be charging that battery at maybe 100 amps. But if your battery bank is about 400 amp hours of capacity and 400, even lithium, that's not a big lithium battery bank, 400 amp hours. It's pretty reasonable. Well, then the challenge is how will we ever take advantage of charging that battery bank at three times capacity, meaning at 1200 amps? Mm. You won't. So it's sort of a cool stat to have on paper. But for many of us with reasonable size battery banks, even if it was a 200 amp hour lithium battery bank, we'll never be able to you know, recharge that battery bank at 400 or 600 amps. So that's one where it's maybe more marketing than actually a tangible benefit. Totally. But it still is, yeah, not to such an extent, but it still is more. It is air. more than lead acid. <laughs> and then also the big advantage with lithium is that the whole battery bank from 100%, probably down to 30% or 20% of capacity is usable. That's something that you can't get in a lead acid battery because that top end takes forever right? That absorption charge. Most, most of us don't get that. And so we end up oscillating between either 50% to 85% of capacity if it's flooded. And then for super cycle AGMs and some AGMs where we're willing to sacrifice life, you can probably go down all the way to 30. Totally. No, that's why so, we are pretty torn because there is some real benefits to it. Um, but yeah, we are like wondering, do we our, need it? Because it yeah, with some complications, doesn't it? Yeah, that's exactly right. And so there's always, but the things to consider, lithium can't really be used for high amperage circuits like engine starting. So you're going to need to have uh, either an AGM or another type non-lithium battery for your engine start. That's where it gets complicated is, well, how do you get one alternator? And we'll talk about that a little bit later out. How do you get one alternator to do two charge profiles? Is that possible? And then the other limitation is that there's this thing with lithium that calls a BMS, right? So there's internal BMSs and there's external BMSs. And then beyond even external BMSs, there's external BMSs that also control both charging and load buses. Mm -hmm. So like everything, not everyone creates the same product. And as you pay more, you get more features. And those features are generally for redundancy. You know, drop in lithium batteries will generally have an internal BMS and that internal BMS is going to potentially disconnect the battery, both loads and uh, charging circuits. If ever something triggers the BMS to say, Hey, listen, you know, I'm getting overcharged or I'm, you know, the voltage is too low or the battery's too cold, right? All these different BMSs are going to literally have software that are going to basically protect the battery. So that's where it gets complicated is now it's not just a dead battery or a simple battery anymore. You need a little bit of, you know, a little bit of a little computer there called the BMS to be able to manage that properly. And where it gets more complicated is, well, what happens if ever the battery disconnects, right? What if the BMS disconnects while your alternator is running? Well, you know, if the alternator is the only thing connected to that battery, when the BMS says, I can't take it anymore, I'm disconnecting myself, not only will you lose everything on the boat, everything is going to go dark, but because your alternator was not being told to disconnect or stop outputting because it's an internal BMS and there's no communications port, well, then your alternator is most likely going to have a catastrophic failure. And that's where a lot of people worry. It's like, well, how do I make sure that if ever my internal BMS disconnects 
that I'm actually going to not lose my alternator. I think you had brought up that point. Well, where does the alternator output go then? Is it going to go to your starter battery? Is it going to go, and then you're going to recharge your lithium with a DC to DC charging converter, right? Which you might, or do you do actually through a battery isolator? Now, the problem with a battery isolator is that your external regulator can only be configured for one single charge profile. Even though you have a battery isolator, the alternator cannot, you know, it's like cooking at home, right? Mm -hmm. You, if you've got a family, you know, you're cooking one meal, everyone's having the same meal, regardless of what their nutritional sort of recommendations are. But, you know, mom and dad cook the meal. It's one meal that you're all sharing. And it's the same thing with an alternator. The alternator cannot charge to two charge profiles. Mm -hmm. And that's where it gets complicated having lithium and AGM on one boat. It's not to say it's not able to overcome, but it's a consideration that you have to solve in your design. Mm -hmm. Have you, what's your thought on where are you leaning and why on that question? In terms of lithium versus AGM? Yeah. And, and more importantly, how do you go about recharging? Have you given thought to the limitations uh, of having a lithium on board or the workarounds? Quite a lot. Mm. I, I just like redundancy. Uh, so I think to have enough redundancy with lithium, it makes for many components and yeah, bigger system overall. So the benefit is, yes, lithium is lighter and less volume, but on the other side, am I taking that volume up again because I need still an AGM bank? I still need maybe a separate starter bank, the BMS, um, the separating charge bus from load bus. Uh, so that all creates a little bit of a headache um, in the system too. I don't know if if we require a lot of amp hours. If you do, then lithium is the obvious choice um, and you just make it work because that's uh, what you need. But that's where I am still divided, where if I can fit AGMs, uh, then that's simpler for me because it's what I know. And and to me, there is that redundancy that I don't want the blackout and I want to and lose everything. So if I go lithium, I like the idea of having lithium the benefits of lithium, but in case it, it shorts and it's not available, that I still have power. I don't want to go lithium and possibly lose it all. How often does this losing it all scenario happen? Yeah, so it well, hope is not a strategy. Uh, no. And it happens enough that people worry about it. It yeah. does. It really does. The, the sort of the solutions for that, it depends, right? So uh, let's talk about one scenario. One scenario is you have an external BMS, and this is maybe... From a complexity perspective, it certainly adds a little bit more complexity, but there are benefits to it for sure. And we do this, this scenario that I'm going to describe is, I would say half the boats we do. And the scenario where you have a lithium battery bank with an external BMS, and that BMS allows you the ability of controlling both a load bus and a charging bus. And uh, companies like Lithionics do that, Victron too. And this is where it gets really kind of neat because now you don't have one condition affect all situations, right? So if your battery, for example, is uh, being overcharged through a faulty solar controller, a faulty regulator that's causing over voltage, could happen, it does happen. What would happen is your lithium battery bank would disconnect that charge, but all your loads would still be connected. And that's pretty neat. That sounds like, oh, why doesn't everyone do that? Well, the problem with this scenario is that the costs are much higher, much, much higher than drop-in internal BMSs where you simply don't have to worry about having an external BMS. You don't have to have a charging DC bus, a DC load bus. And then also you don't have to integrate your uh, external BMS to potentially like a wake speed regulator so that you can actually start communicating so that your BMS actually starts telling your alternator exactly what to do. That scenario is great from a functionality perspective, but you brought a good point. You know, it, it does separate loads and charging. It does give you the ability of never having this sudden disconnect of your battery bank for overcharging. It doesn't help you for when the battery bank fails. Uh, and that's where... Um, 
some builders are installing this sort of like source selector switch on their house. Like before, remember, like a lot of boats 10, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, would have two battery banks for their house. What some people are doing is they're saying, okay, my, I'm going to put all my eggs pretty much in lithium, but I'm going to have a backup, much smaller battery bank that's made of AGM batteries for the house. Mm -hmm. Just something that would, if ever the lithium decides, because let's say it's too cold or whatever, it's got a situation and it decides to go dark. And not only is it not receiving a charge, but it's not running any of your loads. Then what you could do is change your source selector switch and actually run your house loads via an AGM battery bank. Yeah, that's my preferred system that I was looking at um, when I was comparing them all. Yeah. Now, the downside of that is, you're right, the installation is a little bit more complicated, but the beauty of it is the BMS can communicate directly with a wake speed, let's say, for example, external regulator. You won't have that situation if ever the BMS decides to shut off. Before it disconnects the charging bus, it would effectively disconnect the alternator. Mm -hmm. So it basically tells, and it's the future, right? I mean, ideally later on, we want different components on our boats to be able to communicate with what they want, right? So if the battery says, I need to charge, you know, instead of saying right now, we're putting the intelligence in the alternator, well, with lithium, what they're doing is it's effectively really putting some of the intelligence back in the battery. And so the battery is communicating with the external regulator, telling them, hey, you know what, um, stop charging that would allow a soft shutdown of the alternator as opposed to a hard shutdown of the alternator, which is good because it saves your alternator. Mm -hmm. I see. So with that scenario, saving the alternator is the communication that goes on. So the wake speed telling the alternator, and it's not that I still have AGMs in place that take the load spike. Uh, you don't. Yeah, okay. so now there's communication and it's communication from the BMS to the wake speed and the wake speed effectively controls the alternator, but the there is there is ability to integrate a lithium external BMS. Not all of them, but many of them will actually integrate to a wake speed external regulator. Mm -hmm. A little bit more complicated though, right? You have to put it out there. This is not going to resonate with everyone, right? Because now you're like, well, how do you trouble a BMS if it doesn't work? Well, <laughs> you know, you're not going to, It's it's not a battery. Right. It's not that simple. Mm -hmm. But if any of these pieces stop working, the external BMS, um, you know, the wake speed external controller, which is way more sophisticated than internal regulator. Well, how am I going to solve the problem? Those are the types of scenarios that we basically want to worry about. Mm -hmm. Right. Totally. Like, what if? Mm -hmm. What if? So now in this case, from all we've said so far, let's say we have that spare alternator somewhere underneath the V-berth. And we have a few AGM batteries within that system, right? So worst case, if it's not troubleshooting and trying to fix uh, the BMS or the, the um, external regulator, would it just be relying on those spare batteries and the extra alternator in case they want on the Yeah, AGM? right. So your redundancy is not a redundancy of the more complicated system with all the bells and whistles maybe the replacement and the redundancy comes from simply having a much simpler system in the meantime, right? Like a, a back to the basic system, just to get you back to a port, right? A place where you can do further diagnostics or you can return a broken part and have it fixed under warranty or, you know, whatever it is, as we all know, when we're on our boats, you know, the electrical system is essential. I think yeah. man, many of us um, with lithium, don't necessarily do what we would want. We do what we can afford. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the downside with lithium is cost. Now, some people are going to say, well, Jeff, that's not fair because you get way more cycles out of the battery. And they're right. Um, but it, have it up front. Yeah. Which is a thing. Yeah, that's right. It's all up from cost. And very few of us will ever be able to enjoy 3,000. 5,000 cycles, you know, on my boat, you know, it might take me two, three, four days to bring down the battery bank to a low level. Well, that's one cycle. Mm -hmm. And if I can do that 3,000 times, well, not many of us are going to get to be able to spend 6,000 days on anchor 
So the yeah. benefits of these crazy high cycles don't necessarily materialize for all of us. Yeah. A lot more for cruisers though. Yeah. Right? No, for us. You're the closest person other than industrial applications where they're using it every day. That's where cruisers that will literally go offshore are probably the most highest candidate for lithium. Where a lot of people are doing an internal BMS, then maybe what they're going to do is they're maybe not going to go super high output alternator. They're going to dump all the energy from the alternator to the AGM battery. And then they're going to use DTC to DC charging converters to charge the lithium at the right charge rate. So the lithium DC to DC converters could suddenly see a battery that disappears and that's fine. And the alternator would only be connected to the AGM battery. That's one scenario uh, that we see a lot. But what the problem with that is that right now, although that's going to change, Victron's DC to DC charging converters are only limited to about 30 amps. The rumor is that they're coming up with a 15 and 60. That's going to be a big changing game changer. Because then what you could end up doing is you could have your high output alternator directly connected to your AGM start bank and then have a DC to DC or multiple of them and then have that to be able to basically recharge your lithium bank only whenever the AGM battery as a what's considered a charging voltage. Well, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. So that's another scenario. In the past, the limitation was, well, at 30 amps a pop, that takes a lot of DC to DC converters to get a really high charge rate back into the lithium. But now that Victron is imminently going to be output, uh, produce, or giving us higher amperage DC to DC, you know, like you might, you know, three of that will give you, let's say 150 or 180 amps. That's a lot. So that was the other scenario that's really popular is for voters that don't want to go through all the expense in doing the external BMS and they're looking for a more simple solution. A question with that scenario. Let's say the, uh, the lithium, uh, the BMS shuts down the lithium and the starter batteries are full though and the alternator is still outputting. Does that hurt the AGMs as well? Or can they just... Do that? No, because quickly, very quickly, good question. Very quickly. Let's say, for example, the scenario, just to recap, you've got a high output alternator, let's say outputting it's 120 amp alternator. It's got an external regulator. It's recharging only one battery bank, the AGM. So it's set for an AGM charge profile. What's going to happen is if there's no lithium battery, for whatever reason, it doesn't matter, that high output alternator will quickly uh, be controlled by the regulator. And the AGM battery will never get overcharged because that's the job of the external regulator is to really limit the charge. The fact that you add a lithium battery in parallel, because that's basically what you're doing through these DC to DC charging converters. If the DC to DC charging converters ramp up and now they start taking 50 amps, but they're only going to take that amperage out of the AGM battery if the AGM battery is in a charging state. So as soon as, for example, let's say that now everything's charged. So alternators outputting the AGM, the AGM battery is at, let's say, it's not at 14.4, uh, it's at 13.8. And why is it not maxed out? Well, the reason is because you have a large load. And what's that load? Well, the load is the three or one or two or whatever it is, DC to DC charging converters. And they might be taking 30 amps, 50 amps. If suddenly the battery disappears, unlike an alternator, they're going to be fine. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Uh, clear, clear that one up. Yeah. So it's it's a fear. It's a common fear, uh, but that one that will be uh, handled by the alternator regulator, and ideally an external regulator, because an external regulator is way more sophisticated. Yeah. There's a lot to consider here. You don't just which, plug and play. Which is still which, very difficult because yeah. it's still, it is so appealing, um, especially as you said, for cruisers. We could yeah. take advantage of that. But we have to Huge. just push them around mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Yeah. The other big thing for cruisers, why lithium is another big advantage, is the biggest challenge for lead acid batteries for cruisers is because it's so hard to get the last 20 or 15 and, and over time, 25, 30%, because as the battery ages, that absorption point in terms of capacity becomes lower and lower. So you actually have less and less usable mm -hmm. battery capacity for bulk charging. Yeah. And where it gets even worse is for all of us that connect back to a grid, AGM batteries can handle, have a low self-discharge, but they also, the one thing they hate 
is they hate being in a partial state of discharge. And so the advantage uh, with lithium is you don't have to go through that. And you don't have to worry about that 20% of battery capacity. How are you going to ever recharge that battery capacity back to 100? If you have a lead acid battery and you could have a large solar array, what are the odds that you're going to, during that day, without running the engine, you're going to have such a large solar array that you'll get back to 100%. And so that means that your charging will exceed all your loads that day and will do so quickly enough to get to 100% of capacity, not every day, but on some days. And that is a bar that many of us will never get. And if we do, very rarely. There is an argument for catamarans there. <laughs> and that's right. Uh, 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 a catamaran, because they have so much surface area, is able to do that a lot easier than a sailboat, right? They'll have way larger solar arrays than many of us are going to get on a monohull. Lithium gives you that advantage of not having to worry about being a partial state of discharge. So, I mean, it so, sounds like lithium is what we want. Well, it's, it's there fine. are negatives, but there is a lot of pros in for your application. So, and then the, the negative with all this, and I, and, I, and I think it's important to put it out for all the other boaters is the acquisition cost up front is very high. As a boater, I don't want to discourage anyone that says, oh, I can't have lithium or I can't afford lithium. I can't go boating. No, 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 no. no. Mm -hmm. People have been boating for longer than there's been lithium and it's fine. I think all of us need to remove as many obstacles in our mind to go and boating. We should talk also about... Um, the pros and cons of 12 versus 24. Do you want to maybe describe where your head's at, uh, both of you? Well, to put it simply, we know that 24 volt devices would run more efficiently and that we could have wire size, which is a reduction in both cost and weight. So those being the two major things makes one think, well, 24, no doubt about it. But on the other side, I'm leaning towards 12 volts just because of boat size, it not being necessary and our boat not being too complicated with too many devices. Yeah, maybe I'm missing something in the in the entire picture. Yeah, so you're absolutely right. I mean, I don't think I've ever seen a 36 foot boat with 24 volt. And I don't think I would do it on my own boat. The real main reason why people do 24 is to reduce cabling size and to reduce the effects of voltage drop the benefits that you're going to get from a 24 system, certainly for an alternator, it would help, right? To have half the current go through, right? The inverter, again, half the current, half the cable sizes, but those devices are not going to be that far. And I don't think your alternator, uh, it can be that huge because it's really going to be a function of your size of your engine. You, you can't choose any alternator you want. That's going to be a factor, realistically, that's going to limit all the benefits of going with a 24 volt system. I'm not saying the decision is final and you can all, all of this is sort of, you're gonna all sleep on it, but 99% of people would probably choose 12 at your boat size, mm -hmm. at your boat size. Now, if you had a 60 footer, completely different. And I would strongly suggest to go to 24. Just out of curiosity, like a lot of cruising boats nowadays are around the 45 foot range. Like what would you start recommending for that size? Still probably they're on the fence, but most people for simplicity would stick at 12, even, even 45. Yeah. Of course, if we could all start from scratch, every boat should be 24. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if everyone was using 24, we'd all be happier. Right? And on that same note, if we would start from scratch, then we would probably make AC 240 volts. And we would use metric and not imperial, wouldn't we? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. There would be no imperial. That's right. And although I think only an imperial mostly because I just have to, uh, you're right. It's, it's, we don't do what we want. We do, we have to be relatable, right, to others. Mm -hmm. So if everyone talks in imperial, then I'm adapting, right? And yeah. so mm -hmm. I think the same thing with your boat. You, we don't do what we want. We do what we should do based on the environment around us. So 1224 is a thing to uh, think about. Another one too. The, the big one is going to be AGM versus lithium. The other big decision that we have to make is, do we go external BMS or internal BMS? And then that dis, those decisions then are going to set up how do we size the battery bank. And then once we decide how big a battery bank we're going to size, then we end up choosing how big of an alternator we're going to put in. And then also then we end up choosing like realistically, how big of a solar array do, should we have? Like how big does it need to be? And do we have more space than we need or are we gonna do, do what we can? And for most of us, 
And Maya, you started off saying that at the beginning. Most of us with solar, unless we have a catamaran, I don't think I've ever had a monohull that had more power than we needed. Bigger the boat, bigger the power. So if you have a 60 foot, uh, you're going to have a large solar array, but you're going to have a large power system. We, we have the same boat size. My boat is 3.6. My solar array is right now about 550 watts. Mm -hmm. And it's definitely not too big. Maybe sometimes in the summer, a peak output, maybe on certain beautiful days when I'm not using a lot of power, the lights are never on. I'm always outside. I'm not using anything. I'm not cooking. I, yeah, of course, I have more than I need on some days. Mm -hmm. But most of the time, that array is not sufficient. Well, that's such an important point. Because, you know, one thing that we've been seeing pop up a lot recently as we decide on various components of the boat is a lot of people suggesting, well, why don't you just use induction as your primary cooking method? And it's like, oh, yeah. well, okay, if you're going to use induction as your primary cooking method, you're actually using diesel as your primary cooking method, the way I see it. Like, well, yes and no. Power. Or, or what are your thoughts? Well, it's pretty amazing. Even on my own boat, I've had my propane system on my boat fail. Fail because of me, because I forgot to fill a tank or assumed I had enough. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you're far away. And sometimes your backup tank is also empty. And running an induction stovetop is surprising. You know, you can warm up a meal in a matter of minutes because they run it for such a short period of time. Now, you can't make a feast, right? Like, it's not going to be <laughs> the meal of your lifetime where you need an oven, multiple burners, you're mm -hmm. simmering on slow. This is not a three hour. But if you're warming up a meal or making something relatively simple, I have one on my boat as a backup. So if I ever lose my propane system, I'm not, and again, maybe I'll let you know it's going to resonate with you. I'm like, well, at least I have that. And then in those situations, at least it allows me to warm up a meal. I love the idea of induction as a backup. As That's a backup, awesome. like, yeah. but we were considering it as the main source, if it could replace um, propane or alcohol. And there we found it challenging because we are not simple cookers. Um, if you well, do simple cook three meals, times a day, right? yes, but yeah. exactly. We cook three times a day and dinner is, uh, there's quite a bit of emphasis on that. We don't have a generator, so we scrapped that idea. But as a backup, absolutely. When we do yeah. have the power or if we need it, then the engine becomes a generator. And I mean, you do have to cook. So the I, I, idea is totally valid. Totally. So yeah, it's actually in the power draw is not that bad. For example, they'll say it's a 1600 watt or 1800 watt model. The meal is done in or warmed up in three minutes, five minutes. That's really interesting. Well, because I've never used induction. So I was just researching it and I saw like 1500 amps, 2000 or watts, 2000 watts. And I was like, oh, but that, that's not going to work. But no, that's a good point. You're not using it at that capacity most of the time. Never. I'm never even boiling water. Three minutes, no problem. Battery bank can handle it. Again, if you're in a place where it's relatively sunny, you don't have that many loads. In the summer months, not crazy that you can actually save your propane and run your literally a small little induction stovetop uh, power through an AC outlet, through an inverter to your battery bank, and effectively you're cooking from the sun. And not heat that. up the boat. I think that's huge redundancy because eating, let's be, let's be honest, yeah. not all meals can be cold. So <laughs> yeah. meals can <laughs> No, <laughs> no, I actually, I, I really like that idea. I, I've been thinking about that for a while as a backup. I, I don't think it will work as our primary cooking method, but yeah. as a, as a double with, with propane, I really like that idea. Yeah, no, that's why I like the idea of backup and mm -hmm. I'm still designing um, the best possible propane system at the moment. Um, Just quickly, Jeff, in terms of time, like, how are you doing? What are you? I, I'm going to, yeah, that's what maybe we should maybe take a pause here. What we could do is call this part one. Mm -hmm. But I think for us, maybe the next time part two would be, we should have either we answer the hard questions and then we can move on. Yeah. Okay. But there are hard questions that I think we need to start. Not to say they're set in stone, but there's just too many variables right now to really start imagining. Yeah, things. totally. Because I mean, yeah, now I'm just like, now that I'm considering lithium, I have to start, well, what system of lithium? Yeah. yeah. And so if we can take a break, I think at this point, I would have you both process. Mm -hmm. We could come back. Part two could be questions, right? Mm -hmm. Part two doesn't have to be, I've got it all figured out. Let's move. It could be, okay, you told all of this information. 
all right, what, you know, and it got yeah. back and forth. <laughs> and then, and then that could be part two. And then part three is like, okay, now that we know this, now that we solidified, we've removed a lot of variables off the table. Like, yeah, we're going to go to 12. Yeah. yeah. We're going to have an AGM start. Yeah. We're going to do lithium or whatever it is. Then we can start. Okay. Well, now that we're having lithium, let's talk about, let's dive in and mm -hmm. let's really focus on where are we going to go on lithium external versus uh, external BMS? Now that's yep. a full could be a separate conversation. Yeah, but we need to remove some of our choices because otherwise the permutations are in. Yeah, totally. Yeah. No, yeah. that sounds great. That yeah. sounds really good. Because and right. there's also a few questions that we didn't get to yet um, that maybe we could bring up in part two, like lightning and stuff. Like that's something I really want to talk about. Yeah, I yeah. have that. Uh, and then we also there's battery isolators, and that's going to affect which battery bank. Uh, yeah. The monitoring is pretty easy. The DC DC charger that's going to affect. We talked about the external regulator. We'll also talk about the galvanic isolator when we talk about the AC. Um, mm -hmm. We'll talk about sizing the inverter. That's going to be something else. And not everyone needs a big inverter. And there's definitely merits to that. Yeah. We'll talk about that. Um, and then uh, solar panels. And then yeah, I saw your your questions are here, right? Yeah. Twelve versus twenty-four AGM buffer lithium setup and uh lightning protection yeah jeff right. thank you so much this is incredible i'm excited for my dad to come home um so we can discuss all this with him because he's been so involved in this as well yeah really? so okay. he's it's even he's better ready. all right thanks you both thank we'll you we'll talk we'll schedule something when you're ready so give it a little bit of thoughts in me your questions and then we'll schedule round two okay all right. sounds good